In all honesty, I don't feel like what I've done is a crime. And I think it's illogical and irresponsible for you to sentence me to prison. None of the real criminals of the world ever end up behind bars. I mean, when you think about it, what did I really do? Cross an imaginary line with a bunch of plants? You say that I'm an outlaw. You say that I'm a thief. But where's the Christmas dinner for the people on relief? Well, that was Johnny Depp in Blow, where he quite unsuccessfully tries to talk himself out of prison um, to a judge. We are going to talk today about a couple other unsuccessful attempts um, to for uh, people to talk their way out of criminal penalties. We're going to talk about that with two uh, men who are very uh, familiar with criminal penalties themselves, although not in the same way. They are two of my colleagues uh, and dear friends, Ari Bargill and John Wrench. Welcome, both of you, back to Short Circuit. Thanks for having me, Anthony. Thanks for having me, Anthony. It's great to be on. They sound very excited with that introduction, um, which is to, as I said, Short Circuit, your podcast from the Federal Courts of Appeals. Uh, I'm Anthony Sanders, the director of the Center for Judicial Engagement at the Institute for Justice, and we're recording this on Wednesday, January 4th, 2023. So it's our first episode of the new year. Happy New Year to everybody. We have a great year ahead of us on Short Circuit, all kinds of live shows, special episodes, um, special things we're going to be talking about. Today, though, we're going to start it off with a, uh, as I said, a more criminal flavor. Um, and, you know, one thing we've never talked about on the show before is that Mr. Bargill, he has an, he had an acting career before he came to IJ, and that involved um, one of the, you know, one of the foremost demonstrations of criminality uh, in the American underworld, which was the show Miami Vice. So, Ari, uh, tell us about your, your past. Sure, Anthony, and Happy New Year to you as well. Um, I, I would start by saying first that I think it's a bit of a stretch to use the word career. Uh, I did have one appearance on an episode of Miami Vice uh, back in, I think, 1989 uh, as a tender five-year-old. My mom, um, perhaps foolishly, responded to a newspaper ad offering to take free photographs of your child. Um, little did she know that the photograph session was free, but the pictures themselves would cost money. Um, and nevertheless, she, uh, she, she went forward with it. Uh, the photographer offered to then show those photos to a talent agent, which my mom also agreed to. And lo and behold, the phone rang asking how quickly I could get to Miami because this talent agent believed that they had the perfect role for me in a then very popular show called Miami Vice. I went down, there were a few auditions. I rattled off some lines. Um, I had a scene with Dennis Farina, um, did not get to hang out with Don Johnson, um, and thus concludes my acting career. Um, and, and I think uh, probably for the better, as I am now uh, a constitutional litigator at the Institute for Justice and not a washed up child actor struggling with substance abuse. Well, uh, true, true. But for, for those of for those listeners who, you know, maybe actually have heard of Miami Vice, and I, I gather probably anyone listening under the age of about 30 has no idea what we're talking about. Um, what, what was the name of the episode, if they want to look that up on Netflix or wherever? The, the name of the episode for, and this is on Netflix, if you, if you really want to, if you really want to take a look, it's uh, World of Trouble. It's season five, which is the the final season, I believe, and it was the, if I'm not mistaken, the penultimate episode uh, of the entire series. I would strongly recommend, though, for you to get a good sense of the backstory that you go back and watch seasons one through four first, um, and then make your way through season five, where uh, a character makes a, a return to see his long lost grandson he didn't know existed played. By so him. it kind of won't make any sense if you don't have the. A prequel and then you've you've got to get right. the backstory. Okay. okay. Well, good. Well, I'm glad we we have that. We'll put a link up in the show notes uh, to more information. Oh, please don't <laughs> about this. <laughs> um, and for uh, other information uh, about um, the well, th this more goes to the, to Johnny Depp's movie that we started with um, to the the drug trade. Although this is a quite I think legal drug trade, although it's not treated that way under federal law. Is this court out of the, or the, this case, 
out of the Second Circuit, uh, United States versus Patterson. So Ari, what's going on here and uh, what might be the connection to um, the federal court system of what these gentlemen were doing? Sure. Um, you know, I think the uh, the lead in with the um, the monologue from Blow was quite fitting because, um, as I think the judge retorts in that movie, which is one of my favorites, um, unfortunately, the imaginary lines you crossed were very much real and the plants you were carrying were illegal. Um, and that forms the basis of what I suspect was the district court's opinion um, and the opinion of the jury, for that matter, in this case. The, the, the plaintiffs, or I should say the defendants in this case, are James Patterson, not the author whose uh, books your mother-in-law and my mother-in-law and everyone's mother-in-law has read dozens of, um, and two gentlemen named Ruben Weigand and Hamid Akavan. Um, and these guys were engaged in essentially a conspiracy um, to facilitate the sale of medical marijuana using credit and debit cards in states where medical and recreational marijuana uh, is legal, like California. Um, as you mentioned a moment ago, Anthony, and as most folks know, marijuana is still illegal under federal law. And for that reason, most banks don't want any part of these types of transactions. Um, but never underestimate the spirit and mind of the American entrepreneur, uh, or in Ruben Weigand's case, the spirit and mind of a guy from Luxembourg caught on LAX on his way to Costa Rica. Um, these gentlemen decided that what they were going to do is set up a series of shell companies um, that purported or appeared at least to be real, um, selling things like dog food and diving equipment. And anytime you wanted to order marijuana from your iPhone, as God intended, um, your credit card would be run through one of these shell companies. And so the banks that were processing these transactions and facilitating the movement of money from purchaser to seller uh, were none the wiser. And for a while, they thought that all of these transactions were completely on the up and up. Um, and this worked for a period of time. Uh, it worked quite well. These, these folks uh, at a company called Ease made in excess of $100 million through these types of transactions. Um, but all good things must come to an end, particularly good things that involve um, using the wires to transfer money uh, for the illicit sale of marijuana. Um, Mr. Weigand, Akavan, and Patterson were all arrested. Um, this is something called transaction laundering. Uh, and in Mr. Akavan's case, he was sentenced to 30 months in prison. He was fined $1,000 of a possible $1 million. Um, and the government also sought, of course, uh, that he forfeit um, quite a bit of money. Uh, the amount of money the government sought, not surprisingly, was every single penny that they could calculate was related to this endeavor, about $170 million total. Um, and they said, at the very least, we've got to be able to get $17 million, which is how much money Mr. Akavan was paid for setting up these companies and helping assist in this fraud, um, which is what he was convicted of, of course. Um, at the end of the day, uh, the court said, I'm going to institute a forfeiture of $103,000, which is the amount of stock in the company that you were given as part of your participation in this scheme. Uh, Mr. Akavan and Mr. Wigan challenged their convictions on appeal. Um, the government cross appeals. Uh, the trial judges assessed forfeiture. Um, they all seem to accept that the forfeiture is subject to the excessive fines clause, which is not always the case, but happened here. It's an interesting side note. Um, anyway, on appeal, um, they challenge a handful of things, including the sufficiency of the evidence, um, some evidentiary and procedural things. You know, they say that the evidence, um, you know, uh, didn't support uh, a conviction in this case. The court starts out by saying, we're going to view the evidence in the light most favorable to the government, um, which is sort of odd in a criminal case. Uh, but I'm not a, 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 I'm not a practitioner or an, ex an expert in that field. So, OK, uh, I am on board with the court acknowledging that basic facts ought to be uh afforded great deference, especially considering uh, the way that uh, courts treat, you know, jury findings and, and things like credibility and, and the weight afforded to certain things. Um, but in any case, the, the defendants and, and appellants here say, you know, our lies were, were not material. The court sort of brushes that aside and says, of course, they were material. These banks would not have been processing these transactions if they had known that the companies were completely fake and that they were in fact participating in the illicit transfer of money in exchange for marijuana. 
Um, and they also raise some evidentiary and procedural objections. They say, you know, we should have been able to get certain evidence in. Some evidence should have been excluded. The jury instructions were wrong. The court says, no, nah, the judge got that right. And they make some argument about the confrontation clause, which the court pretty quickly bats down and says, it was COVID. <laughs> A guy can testify via video when he's the sole caretaker of his 83-year-old mother-in-law. Um, and all of that brings us to an interesting excessive fines discussion, um, because what was at the core of the trial court's decision here on the fine was to award the government the amount that they sought would have violated the excessive fines clause. And it would have violated the excessive fines clause primarily because the fine that the government sought, whether it be $153 million or whatever it was, or the $17 million that they were seeking, was several orders of magnitude greater than what the criminal fine imposed could be or was. Um, they go through the Bajikajian factors, which uh, loyal listeners of this show might know, but I'll, I'll provide really quickly. And I think that was a very good um, pronunciation uh, of that case, Bajikajian. Bajikajian? It took me years to figure that out. Not not my first time uh, uttering it, <laughs> um, in fact, and have have uttered it um, with some success and and uh, some some lack of success in the federal courts myself. But in any event, um, the the court applied the excessive uh, fines analysis articulated by Bajikaji and at least the second circuit consideration of it, which consists of four factors. The first being the essence of the crime of the defendant and and its relation to other criminal activity. Courts will consider, two, whether the defendant fits into the class of persons for whom the statute was principally designed, third, the maximum sentence and fine that could have been imposed, and four, the nature of the harm caused by the defendant's conduct. And in reversing the trial court's order on the forfeiture, the Second Circuit says, hey, you kind of overvalued the third factor. Um, which is that uh, the which is the comparison between the fine sought or the fine imposed and what could have been imposed here? You know, the district court said, "Hey, the statutory scheme calls for a maximum fine of a million dollars for this offense. I actually only imposed a thousand dollars, so awarding the seventeen million that the government is seeking here is way beyond that." Um, and then the district court also went ahead and considered other factors, namely the harm. Um, and, and who was actually hurt here. And they also said, yeah, you know, this is major fraud, but nobody actually got hurt. And in fact, a lot of people actually made quite a bit of money here. So what really is the fraud? You know, the victims here, supposedly the bank yeah, also got quite rich off of this endeavor. Um, and goes almost as far as saying, Hey, getting marijuana delivered to your door from your iPhone by way of your credit card is actually pretty awesome. <laughs> um, but nevertheless, the, the circuit court says, hey, you know, you put too much emphasis, uh, the, the district court did, on the comparison between the potential fine that could have been imposed and the forfeiture that we're seeking. And it doesn't always matter that the potential fine um, be so far in excess, or it doesn't always matter, I should say, that the fine that the government is seeking severely exceeds what the maximum criminal penalty would be for the same conduct because sometimes the the criminal enterprise can be so lucrative that it makes sense. And so they send the case back down and they say, take another look at this, reconsider whether this gross discrepancy between the maximum criminal fine and the forfeiture imposed is actually enough uh, to carry the day here and, and reconsider that in light of our case law that, that basically says where a criminal enterprise is super lucrative, it's okay for there to be a gross disparity between the amount of money sought in forfeiture and the, uh, and the potential maximum fine, which in this case, like I said, was a million dollars and where the, the district court only imposed a fine of a thousand dollars. I think there are a couple interesting takeaways here for people who follow the excessive fine stuff. Um, you know, there, there's some discussion about the extent to which courts have discretion in imposing these fines. It was nice that the court here didn't batter the district court for just kind of calculating what it thought was an appropriate fine and not just reflexively ruling in favor of the government. They sent it back down and they said, hey, you might still find that this fine is unconstitutionally excessive, but just make sure you make that finding in light of what we're telling you here. Um, and the court also said, and this is something that I, I don't know that I've really seen uh, too much of before, that when recalculating or considering what the fine should be, your imposition of the fine can't be any less 
than what is absolutely necessary to avoid an excessive fines problem. In other words, figure out what the dollar figure is of an unconstitutionally excessive fine would be, f f figure out that amount, reduce it by a dollar, and that's your fine. <laughs> Um, and, and so, so there, there is, there is a little bit of, of play in the joints, I guess, between not, not telling the district court that it, it abused its discretion, but at the same time articulating to the district court, here's how you find what, what your, uh, appropriate figure should be in, in assessing, um, excessiveness in the course of imposing this forfeiture. And, and that is the story, and that is the story of Mr. Akavan, um, who had a good idea, um, but maybe should have quit, quit while he was about $17 million ahead. Uh, John, uh, where, where do you see the excessiveness? I mean, it is, it is interesting that the, the district court, and I imagine that this is what, what the circuit court was at least thinking in part is, it's interesting that the district court realized that it needed to be careful of imposing a fine that was too high and then dropped quite a bit below um, what the criminal maximum would have been. And I do wonder if the circuit court saw that and said, um, you know, there's you, you could there was quite a bit of space between one hundred thousand dollars and a million dollars. You know, you could have done all these things. And I, I found it interesting that, at least from my understanding, I don't think the district court said that its um its decision was based entirely on that factor but there was something there was something in that decision that the circuit court said even though it wasn't based entirely on it it looks like it was based mostly on it or too much on it and that does call into question you know what do you have discretion um to impose with those factors and it almost invites the district court to come back and and say uh, that they reach the same conclusion, but they're going to emphasize the other factors a little bit differently, and they're going to analyze it a little bit more um, thoroughly, and maybe underemphasize the maximum po maximum fine. But it, it, I do appreciate that the circuit court opinion doesn't exactly call for um, the conclusion that that it it wasn't excessive. It it does keep some discretion with the district court. I thought it was. It interesting that the that could have played more into the opinion and uh, and I see I guess I see why it didn't is is the bank's role in all this because they they do briefly say that the bank was act ba bank officers are actually involved in the trial and they said yes we would we would not have taken this money if we had known that it was for sales of medical marijuana which I think they probably have to say to like keep their license <laughs> Or their charter is a federal bank because um, that's the whole you know if they knowingly took that money then that they themselves would be in trouble. But they obviously were totally cool with making money off this, like and any bank is with any business. And um, I, I, there's no you know although the the court credits the the the, the testimony of the officers, um, it doesn't take into account that. Of course, they're going to say that because they themselves would be would would be in hot water if they didn't, and that and therefore there is no you know the what they were prosecuted for this the wire fraud or, or bank fraud is actually not something that harmed anybody. Now you could say, well, marijuana itself is is illegal, and so that therefore that is what they are being prosecuted for. But that that it wasn't exactly what they were charged with, so it seems like there's a disconnect in in all of that, um, that I don't know, maybe is underlying some of what the district court did. Yeah. I think all of this underscores just the utter sham that is this country's policy toward marijuana, um, and, and it's, it's sale and consumption. Um, to John's point, you know, I think, I think you're probably right that they're inviting the district court to maybe just get it right on the law, not overemphasize the disparity between the amount that could have been imposed and the amount the government is seeking, and maybe play up the fact that this is utterly victimless. All of this is victimless. These are people who are facilitating transactions between willing buyers and willing sellers who, as far as they know, is certainly in the, in the, in the shoes of the, of the, of the buyers, um, are, are, are engaged in, in lawful commerce. Um, these transactions are not technically illegal in states that allow for medical and recreational cannabis, um, and the federal government's involvement here um, is always curious and useless 
and like I said before, just underscores how um, difficult it is to navigate this space with with banks happily accepting the money as long as they can say that they didn't know where it was coming from. And I, I strongly suspect, Anthony, I agree with you. Um, I strongly suspect that the banks probably had an inkling or could have checked and found out relatively easily whether the fake dog food <laughs> companies out of the Caymans well, we're really doing such gangbusters business uh, uh, for for because they were selling such amazing uh, dog food and dive supplies and face cream. Well, from one victimless crime, we're going to go to another one, which um, maybe not maybe a bit of a property rights violation: parking illegally in a driveway. So, John, how did this turn into um, a federal crime? Yeah, so this uh, I just want to start with uh, the title of the case because I, I think it's it's great. It's in the case caption there are about about seven or eight different um, aliases for the the defendant, but it's United States versus Jonathan Edward Charles Anderson, and the best of the aliases is X Rage, <laughs> um, and so. At around two a.m., Jonathan Anderson or X Rage, you you know you can you can pick whatever one uh, you like. Uh, he was driving around uh, in San Bernardino in a, in a truck in California, and a sheriff's deputy initiates a stop of the truck because the license plate was apparently partially obscured, and that you know it's the only time there's a mention of 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 the license plate. Uh, but according to the deputy, Anderson then turns down a dead end street after the deputy has already activated his lights, and then pulls into a driveway about. 30 to 45 seconds later. And so the deputy later says that he believed Anderson was attempting to flee. So when the deputy leaves his vehicle, he confronts Anderson at gunpoint. Anderson says that he uh, didn't see the overhead lights, he wasn't from the area, and had parked in um, a friend's driveway. And even there, you, you might get a little bit of tension of, I'm not from this area, I don't know where I am, oh, this is my friend's house that I pulled into, but we'll, we'll get there. Um, but regardless, the deputy radios dispatch, um, and around 2.05 AM and that time will matter, um, later, the dispatch informs the deputy that Anderson is a career criminal and has an expired license. And so right, right there, we are now, we've moved from something that you know, was a random traffic stop to something. If you put yourself in the deputy's shoes, you might think that they are thinking things like there might be something in this vehicle that's evidence of criminal activity. And, um, you know, I, I think that that plays out. There's a lot of disagreement about what comes directly after. Anderson says that the deputy immediately searches his truck after he finds out that Anderson has a record. The deputies claim that the search didn't immediately happen. They said that they told Anderson his truck would be towed because he didn't have a valid license and that the deputies were going to conduct an inventory search. And I'll talk a little bit about what an inventory search is in a little bit. But the deputies also refuse Anderson's request that a friend come get his truck, which is interesting because, you know, even though he said he didn't know where he was and he's not from the area, he did request that a friend come pick up his truck. So maybe there, you know, there was an opportunity for someone that he knew nearby to come and get it. Um, but regardless, the deputies say no. <clears throat> um, the deputies also testified that before they conducted the search, they went up to the house um, where Anderson had parked. They knocked on the door. The homeowner came out. And the person who Anderson claimed was his friend had no clue who Anderson was. Um, he, he had never met him before. And neither uh, Anderson or the deputies are in disagreement about that. The homeowner did not know who Anderson was. E even as X-Rage, I don't think he knew him. Even as X-Rage, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't know if they went through each of the aliases to double check, but uh, he didn't know any of the versions of Mr. Anderson. So... Uh, that's what officers say. Officers say that they went and they talked to the homeowner before conducting the search. The homeowner, and this, this is important later too for the court's analysis, the homeowner actually says it took him uh, a minute or two to get up, to get to the door, and that they then spoke with the deputies for three to five minutes. Uh, so, But regardless of when the search occurred, the deputies end up searching Anderson's truck while it was in the driveway. And they found a loaded handgun under the driver's seat. 
So they arrest Anderson for being a felon in possession of a firearm. One deputy takes Anderson to jail, while the other one stays behind with the truck to complete an inventory search, which included filling out inventory search forms. So what these forms are is um, police department, sheriff department, they have forms whenever they're conducting something that's called an inventory search. It's a vehicle that's been taken into police custody. And the forms usually require officers to do something like what it requires them to do here. It requires them to identify any personal property contained in the vehicle. And so on that form here, the deputy identified two radios in the car and the firearm. But there was a bunch of other stuff in the truck. There was uh, there were two pairs of, of expensive sunglasses a watch, uh, there was a box of tools, there was a bottle of cologne, there was a speaker, and none of that makes its way onto the inventory form. Uh, the government then charges Anderson with a single count of felon in possession of a firearm and the ammunition. Uh, Anderson moves to suppress the evidence, and he argues that both the impoundment and the inventory search of his truck violated the Fourth Amendment. The district court denies his motion to suppress. He enters a guilty plea, but reserves his right to appeal the suppression order. So his appeal makes it up to the Ninth Circuit, and it's heard by a three panel, a three judge panel, um, including judges Yakuta, Lee, and Forrest. And that will matter because there are three judges, and there are also three opinions uh, in this case. Um, the majority opinion is per curiam, which means that it's it's not issued. Uh, by any, it's not signed by any particular ju justice. It's issued by the court. Um, but judges Lee and Forrest each write separate opinions, dissenting in part for different reasons. Um, so three judges, three opinions. So the Ninth Circuit needs to answer two questions. Really, the first one is: Was the impoundment of Anderson's truck lawful? And if so, was the subsequent inventory search lawful? So starting with the with the impoundment. The majority says, under the Fourth Amendment, the general rule is that the government can't search or seize your vehicle without a warrant supported by probable cause. But there are exceptions to the rule. One of those exceptions is uh, when the government has a so-called community caretaking justification. And under this community caretaking exception, officers can impound vehicles without a warrant when the vehicle impedes traffic or it threatens public safety. So an example of that might be a vehicle parked in the middle of a street or a vehicle that's been totaled and it's lying in a ditch. Um, the community caretaking exception allows police to uh, take custody of that vehicle and remove it from where it is. That exception also then allows officers to conduct an inventory search of the vehicle that they've taken into their custody. And an inventory search complies with the Fourth Amendment so long as it's guided by some general standards, usually a police handbook or, or something like that. And it can't be, this is very important uh, for the all three of the opinions, an inventory search cannot be simply a pretext for a criminal search. So police can't take the vehicle into custody and then do a uh, nominally administrative search to see what's in the car when really what they're doing is they're looking for evidence of a crime. So the majority says there's some disagreement about when the deputies searched Anderson's truck and at what point and for how long deputies spoke with the homeowner. And that matters because if officers conducted the search and then found the, the gun before there was a valid reason to impound the truck, the community caretaking exception doesn't apply, and there's probably a Fourth Amendment violation and they, because they needed a warrant. But the majority says the deputies testified that they didn't conduct the search until after speaking with the homeowner, uh, until they learned that the homeowner didn't know Anderson, and they learned that Anderson was a career criminal with an invalid license. So he couldn't drive his own vehicle away, um, and he had, you know, he had just lied to police and parked in an unknown person's driveway. And so the majority says there is a valid community caretaking purpose for taking custody of Anderson's truck. Two judges on the panel agree with that conclusion, but Judge Lee does not. He says, listen, there's a lot of conflicting evidence about when the deputy searched Anderson's car. And some of that evidence suggests that officers searched the truck before they had a community caretaking purpose. 
Uh, and so Judge Lee would have remanded the case. He would have sent it back down for the district court to figure out exactly what happened. Because if officers did, in fact, immediately search Anderson's car without finding out um, that he wasn't in a friend's driveway, um, that would be a problem. Uh, but you have, you have two judges um, saying that there was a, a valid community caretaking purpose. So the next question is uh, whether there was a valid inventory search. And in essence, Art Anderson argues that the inventory search was unconstitutional because deputies uh, didn't comply with their own guidelines for conducting the searches. Like I mentioned before, um, the deputies noted that there was a firearm um, and two radios in the car, but they didn't mention anything about all of Anderson's other personal property, which uh, was required under the, de the uh, sheriff's department's policies. So <clears throat> the majority rejects that argument. And it says that, yes, the deputies should have inventoried everything, but the failure to complete an accurate inventory is not in itself enough evidence that this was actually uh, a pretextual search for criminal activity. So they're saying, yes, it was an error, but the question is not whether an inventory was perfectly completed, it's whether a poorly completed inventory search indicates that that's not really the reason why you did it. Um, and so although Judge Forrest agrees that there was a community caretaking purpose to take custody, um, he, or just, Judge Forrest argues that the Fourth Amendment was violated because police did not comply with the requirements for an inventory search. And Judge Forrest's point is, you know, we allow officers to dispense with a warrant requirement. We allow them to search vehicles and then conduct a, uh, an inventory search without a warrant because it's supposed to be limited to a very particular goal. And that means that officers actually have to comply with that goal. And if you're conducting an inventory search, maybe you should take an inventory of the vehicle. And it's, it's alarming that when you look at the inventory report, the only real thing that's on there is the piece of evidence that the government wanted to use to convict someone of a crime. You know, the, the officers are kind of telling you why they conducted the search uh, because of what they included on the report. Uh, the majority says, eh, <laughs> compliance doesn't need to be perfect. Failing to list everything in the vehicle just isn't evidence that this was really a search for criminal activity. Um, the majority kind of waves waves that complaint away. It's you know, um, like I said before, their their point is that inventory searches don't need to be perfect. They just can't be cover for a criminal search, and this just wasn't. Um, there wasn't enough evidence to prove that. So Anderson's sentence stands. Uh, two two judges agree that the impoundment was constitutional. Two judges agree that the inventory search was constitutional. Ari, uh, do you think there might have been a wee bit of a pretext here in this inventory search? It awfully, I mean, it certainly seems the case that there there was a little bit more motivating um, the search than than just uh, plain old administrative um, um, reflexive uh, cataloging of of what they found in the car. Um, I, I let me first say I am firmly in the camp of both dissents. Um, it seems to me that uh, the the search itself um, almost strains believability that it could have been done in the amount of time that the police are saying that it was done in, in order for it to have occurred uh, after uh, speaking with the homeowner. Um, and then on top of that, uh, I, I think that we have very strong indications that the inventorying was kind of a pretext to uncovering evidence of a crime. And I think you know, the standard here is what actually seems most concerning to me because basically there's no Fourth Amendment violation unless you can point to some exercise of bad faith on the part of the police or prove that the inventory was solely for purpose of obtaining evidence of a crime. Um, in other words, as long as the government can point to some legitimate law enforcement function, even if it doesn't comply with the relevant guidelines that attach to that function – that's totally fine. And that almost feels like a little bit rational basis -y to me, where as long as there's just this plausibility of legitimacy, um, we're going to look the other way, which I find particularly troubling in the Fourth Amendment context. I also have some concerns with the way the court just kind of waves aside the police officer's 
neglect to follow their own procedures. We see this sometimes in like procedural due process cases where governments have a set of guidelines for providing notice and letting people know that they're, you know, facing a potential deprivation of property, et cetera. And then they violate their own rules. And then courts say, that's okay. You didn't have to follow them anyway, because, uh, you know, rules and regulations are not the same as, uh, you know, constitutional uh, strictures. And, and therefore, uh, the fact that you violated your own rules doesn't mean you violate the Constitution. And I, I think that's wrong, both in that context and here, where what we're talking about is reasonableness. Uh, the court here seemed to say a bunch of times that what matters for the Fourth Amendment purposes is reasonableness. And I would contend that it's reasonable to expect law enforcement to follow their own rules. Uh, we are all expected to follow the rules. Uh, law enforcement often is not expected to follow the, their own rules. Um, and again, this is just an example of, of, I think, law enforcement getting away with a defense that none of us can mount, which is, yeah, maybe I, I, I broke the rules, but I tried to follow them, so everything's okay, right? Yeah, I, I think that this, this both the majority opinion really makes kind of obvious that there might actually just be a law enforcement exception to the Fourth Amendment. There's all, these lab- <laughs> there's, all, there's all these labels that we use, and especially the combination of the exceptions. When you look at them, when you zoom out and you look at them all together, I think that you can make a case that, um, you know, the ability to take custody of the vehicle combined with the ability to inventory the vehicle, and then even how lenient the standards that apply to those rules are. Um, what it really ends up looking like is that the Fourth Amendment is subject to um, what police need to do um, to be able to act on. And I, th- I think here is a good example. I think the police had what turned out to be a, a pretty accurate instinct that um, there might be something in this car that this uh, career criminal, as they said, might be up to no good. But um, – the problem with allowing that discretion to overcome constitutional protections is that you, um, there won't be any constitutional protections after all these holes are poked in it. And I, I think I agree with with Ari is that if you could take both partial dissents and cobble them into an opinion, this would actually be a, a much better opinion. You could either remand it to figure out what was actually going on, whether um, police were. Um, not exactly truthful and how, about when they conducted uh, the search, when they found out that they might have a basis for conducting the search, and that um, if you're not actually doing an inventory of the vehicle, is it really an inventory search? And uh, just just one more thing that I already said that I think is um, is interesting is this this idea that. The distinction between an administrative search and a criminal search is, is kind of hard to believe here that the, that this wasn't actually pretext, <clears throat> and I think that that's that's really a commentary on a lot of the Fourth Amendment exceptions that are related to this idea that when the purpose of the search is criminal, we have the real Fourth Amendment. We have. We have a warrant requirement supported by probable cause. But there's all these situations where police want to do things that are not really about a criminal search. They're more administrative or they're routine. Um, they're for health and safety. They're not about criminal search. And, and there, the Fourth Amendment, you know, is is that really what the Fourth Amendment is about? And so there's justifications that weaken it. Um, so you don't you don't really need a warrant. And this case is a good example of if if an inventory search is really just for an administrative function that does not prevent the fact that there are going to be even criminal um, consequences of of an administrative or routine search and the idea that there is a wall between um, a criminal search and a non-criminal search or that that distinction is based in the fourth amendment i think is is pretty suspect. That that brings up a anecdote from many years ago where we we at IJ had a um, a rental inspections case, which is another area where the the Fourth Amendment gets a much less uh, play because the the search in question, where you're you know inspecting a rental property for health and safety violations, is not a considered law enforcement. Um, where we're discussing the case with attorneys for the city uh, in in this case, and said. You know, well, why do you need to do these inspections essentially? And 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 you, the, if if the 
attorney would knew what they were doing, they'd say, well, the, the inspection, of course, is, you know, to see if there's uh, shoddy wiring or something like that. And the person said, well, there are meth labs in the city. <laughs> Just obviously, this is a pretext for finding something that you couldn't find under nor- normal Fourth Amendment rules. And uh, in this case, with this traffic stop, it's like it's almost a, one of the best examples you you could find of just layers upon layers of um, exceptions to the Fourth Amendment that shouldn't be there, but kind of add up to allowing the police to do whatever they like. Like, for example, e- even if this even if the the homeowner this whole conversation with the homeowner is as the, the police said and so this this car is parked without i mean essentially what it is is the car is parked without permission on private property okay well what do we do about that now obviously the owner doesn't want the car there so yeah you could have a friend who has a valid license drive the, drive the truck but the police say they can't do that. Why? It's not really explained. Okay, how about the policeman himself get in the truck, turn the key, and then pull it onto the street? This is a dead-end street. They probably had on, on-street on parking there to just move it off property and then you know have, the, have a, a, a um, friend or family member of this man come and get the truck in the next day or two, which is probably completely fine under the law. And yet they can't do that. They have to tow it right now. And yet they don't tow it and then do the inventory search at the station, which is actually how I always thought these things go. But I'm thinking now that's not how inventory searches works, perhaps, or at least wasn't this case. They do the search, but obviously before the tow truck even gets there, because it was what, two minutes apparently after the stop, which makes me think this is not an inventory search at all. This was the cops coming up, they is searching the car, finding the gun, and then they they retro, okay, how are we going to justify this? And they could have done it maybe under probable cause if they had smelled marijuana, but they didn't even come up with that. And you know, there's a whole bunch of other exceptions they could have tried to use. And so they come up with, you know, later on, well, the, it was inventory search. Um, which makes me, I mean, I was already as suspicious of the whole inventory search doctrine, but now, I mean, it must be just taught to law enforcement officers over and over again. You, you try and tow that car whenever possible, whatever you excuse you have, because then we can of course do the search without, um, getting a warrant or even probable cause, uh, and which often you don't even need a warrant for a vehicle search. And, um, then you know, you can even do the search before the tow truck arrives and not even bother with the regulations we have for the inventory search, which I'm sure these regulations are only done so we can have better pretext for doing inventory searches. So you have like five layers there of where the Fourth Amendment doesn't apply at all, where this guy... One other thing, like say say I'm borrowing your car and um, you want to search not search the car. You want to like look in the car to make sure there's there what items are in there so it doesn't get lost, right? Because I don't want to be responsible for losing your stuff. So so I I borrow Ari's car and I look around and say, "Okay, there's some sunglasses, you know, there's a radio or whatever. Do I look under the seat to see if there's a, you know, a gun perhaps Ari's gun he left under the seat?" No, no one looks under the seat. And yet the cops in the inventory search looked under the seat and then they itemized that gun and not all this other stuff. It makes no sense. This wasn't an inventory search. It has nothing to do with that. And yet it's held up as, as not a pretext. It's, uh, it's infuriating. Um, and I'm sure this happens you know, every single day in every single city across the country. Okay, rant over. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a good brand. It, you know, that's, this is one of those situations, like, and, and Ari earlier mentioned rational basis, you know, when, when there's these cases where, um, you know, the government comes forward with a, a reason that it's, it's doing something, and um, the only things that the policy is actually tied to are illegitimate things, you have to wonder, maybe the government is actually trying to do an illegitimate thing and backfill it with a bunch of, um, you know, legitimate reasons that are kind of fanciful. Uh, and, and, and this is, I think the, the worst thing about this case for me, this decision for me is, uh, it's not just that the officers potentially, I mean, I think based, based on the factual disputes, there's a good argument to be made that the police 
did search the vehicle pretty quickly. Um, and if they did, then they're, then, then they're, uh, then the government then tried to backfill this with legal arguments to try and justify this as an inventory search. But then, then the court takes all of that and smooths it all out to fit in a bucket, to fit in an exception to the Fourth Amendment, to justify everything that happened in a um, in almost like a bureaucratic way. And, and I think that that's what's so frustrating about what the court did here is, and like uh, like we've we've all been talking about, at what point did the the police take custody of the vehicle? When did they impound it? Because usually that's the term that's used is. Uh, an impoundment precedes an inventory search. So when did the impoundment happen? Well, it's the impoundment happens after the search, and so the court says, you know, there's 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 two steps. There's an impoundment, the police take custody, and then there's a search. And it's not really clear when the police took custody um, because they probably never did. <laughs> they just did the search. But the courts the court smooths all that over and says there's two steps. Police took custody. Did they have a valid reason to take custody? Maybe, maybe not, but probably, and that's good enough. And then, you know, there was an inventory search. It wasn't really an inventory search. It didn't inventory the vehicle. That's also fine. Uh, the law justifies this type of activity. And so, you know, you can you could maybe understand being the, the, the deputies here and having a hunch that you want to act on. You can understand being... You know, the government wanting to justify that hunch, but the courts are supposed to stop and say, does this actually fit into um, our understanding of of the Fourth Amendment's protections? And I, I don't think it does. And I think they validated um, layers of misbehavior. Yeah, Judge Judge Forrest's dissent, I think, kind of touches on this at the end. If I can add this real quick, that that you know, if if we're just doing this sort of mechanistic application of what we think the Fourth Amendment says and how all of these exceptions can work together to allow this type of misbehavior, then this basically just becomes a becomes a game for lawyers and judges. Uh, and I think that's exactly what happened here. the The most disappointing thing about this opinion for me, honestly, is the way that the court just totally swallows the factual narrative that was provided to them by the government in this case. I, I find it um, borderline impossible and unbelievable that um, the, the the sequence of events took place in the way that the police articulated it. It's It astounds me um, that uh, there was only one uh, opinion calling for returning this to the district court to figure out what actually happened. Uh, and instead, we're just going to accept um, – officer testimony that, you know, it's self-serving, yes, but it also seems to defy um, any sense of time or space. And therefore, I, I think that there, there just needs to be a little bit more scrutiny. And that uh, obviously fits in with what we're, what we're commonly talking about here, Anthony, um, from a CJE perspective and, and getting courts to really engage, not just with law, but with, with in this case, with facts. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the paradox from a judicial engagement expect, uh, perspective is two of these three judges thought the case in some way was was done wrongly or should be sent back down at the conviction stands. <laughs> Go figure. Um, well, thank you for uh, sticking around with us listeners. And uh, maybe you can go figure what happened uh, in the, these cases and also what happened on Miami Vice. So we'll leave it there. Thank, the, thank Ari, thank John for uh, coming today. And until next time, I hope that all of you get engaged.